I was thinking about um, this, this presentation, and I've had an opportunity in my life in the past couple of years to be involved with TED, with the TED organization, uh, giving a TED talk in Charlotte and talking about nutrition, um, and working with TED Med, which is uh, uh, TED Med met this past year in Washington, D.C., and we were honored to be a part of it. And through that, I met a, a guy who's a curator for TED, and I just got back about two weeks ago going on a trip with him to uh, Africa. We went to Sudan, to South Sudan, to Juba, South Sudan. It's a good, tough place. We went to Goma and the DRC, and we went to Ethiopia to look at different areas where Famine is occurring. We're partnering with Johnson and Johnson to do some stuff, and it was all through TED stuff. And so, in getting to know these various people in the TED community, uh, I went through a little bit of the TED uh, training, and they said, now, "Here's how you give a good TED talk." And I have been speaking for a long time in Uganda as as a as a walking into a village and, and trying to stumble around and speak, and also as a preacher. So I thought I knew a little bit about speaking, and uh, but I was really interested to see uh, the TED uh, way of speaking. And this is what they said: They said, "Here's where you start." You say this, today I want to change the way you think about blank. And so I was thinking about tonight, and uh, the, there have been TED programs and TED Talks of, that have done all kinds of different TED uh, things. And so the, the big TED question is this, I want to change the way you think about blank. And so my pep talk tonight is I want to change the way you think, and this is an audacious one, about the gospel. And uh, that's a, a, maybe the most ambitious talk ever given, would, would you not say? Especially for a group of Church of Christers. I mean, we know what the gospel is. I was taught what the gospel is. Here's what the gospel is. The gospel is this. How many people know that formula? You've got to hear plus, believe plus, repent plus, confess, and be baptized. And the main thing is being baptized, of course. And if you can do that, then you know the gospel. And if for someone were to stand up and to say, I want to change the gospel, then that would be heresy. And we would say, I'm going to turn this guy off. And you should, because the gospel won't change and can't change. It's been the same forever. Since Christ came, and the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ came and lived and was resurrected, and the resurrected living Christ is alive in this room. That's the gospel. And so if someone would come up and say, I'm going to change the gospel, you should say, I reject that. But what if they said, I'm going to change the way you think about the gospel? And I think back to my time at Harding, and the best speaker I ever heard in my life was a guy named Gil Eagles. And if you ever went to Harding in the 80s, you would have seen this guy. He was a hypnotist from New York, and he was a Jewish guy who would show up. And one time, I got to go pick him up at the airport and bring him back to Searcy, and he would get up. And Hard there's not a lot of things going on in Searcy. I was saying today that you know, God must have at some point sat down with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus and said, you know what, we gave them Lubbock, we gave them Searcy, we gave them Abilene, we have got to give these people something decent, and they gave them Malibu. <laughs> I think that, that's the only explanation for us ending up with Malibu. But if you're in Searcy, there's not a lot going on, and so when Gil Eagle shows up, you're like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I came from Flint, Michigan, and here he was up there speaking, he was the greatest speaker, he was the most entertaining guy, and he would say this at one point in his show, and I saw him four years in a row, because we brought the same entertainers back, Gil Eagles would have half the crowd hypnotized, and if you've ever been to a hypnotist, it is great, isn't it? It's super entertaining. We should certainly have some hypnotists uh, at the uh, Pepperdine Lectures, it would, it would spice things up, and he would say... I want you to yell, and we would all stand up in the Benson Auditorium, and we would be yelling. He said, I want you to yell louder, and we would yell louder, and it was packed. There were 3,000 kids in there, and he would say, I want you to scream at the top of your lungs so that you lift the rafters off of this place, because it is a proven fact that the louder you yell, the more fun you think you're having. <laughs> and it was so right. The louder we yelled, the more fun we thought we were having. And to this day, as I live in my late 40s, I think, man, those were great times because Gil Eagles had framed the conversation differently for me. He changed the way I thought about that, and he, he gave me the frame, and he gave me a new way of, of, of just experiencing uh, this this presentation that he had that just blew me away because he, he decided to tell me this is the way it's going to be. There's, he was using a, a technique that a linguist would say is called framing, and framing is, happens a lot in political uh, conversations. Right now, the political conversations around the United States are being framed in different ways. There's a guy at UC Berkeley named George Lakoff, and George Lakoff wrote a book called Metaphors We Live By. It's a famous book, and I was forced to read it in grad school, and after I got into it, I thought, this is actually a really good book. And as a linguist, Here's what Lakoff said. Lakoff said that metaphors, the book is called Metaphors We Live By, are the way you see the world. Now, linguists before, met, before him 
had said metaphors are a tool. And so you use these metaphors as a linguistic tool to get people to understand things. But Lakoff changed that, and this was way back in 1970 in Berkeley, and everybody's a hippie, and it's really, you know, it's a, it's a free love society, and here he is teaching these linguistic classes. And he says, it's more than that. Metaphor is the way that humans think. Now, what's happened with his book is it's become a classic because we've now looked at that, and neuroscience has proven that the very neural pathways in your brain work on metaphors and on stories. And they work on frames. And so when things get framed in certain ways, that's the way you look at something, and that's the way you tell something, and that's the way you understand something. And so the political conversation right now in the United States, and Lakoff is still around, and he's still talking about it, and you can Google him and read a lot what he has to say about the current election, is that it gets framed in a certain way, and then that's the way we see it. And the metaphors that are told and the stories that are told help us interpret in these certain ways. Now, I remember reading that and thinking how true that was of the gospel how true that was of Jesus. Now, Jesus told metaphors. And he didn't just tell, if you look up metaphor in the uh, parable in the dictionary, it is an extended metaphor. And so Jesus had all these very powerful metaphors. And he used metaphors like this. There was, there was a woman who lost her coins. There was a, a man who lost one of his sons. There was a shepherd who, who had 100 sheep and he lost one of his sheep. So this metaphor of lostness and being found or being saved. And so we grab hold of those metaphors and we say, well, wow, that's really powerful. And so right now in the evangelical world, often you will say, I want to go out and reach out to my friends because they're lost and they need to be found, right? And there are many other metaphors in scripture and they're very powerful. But I would suggest, and what Lakoff suggests, is that there are also many dead metaphors out there that no longer work. And if they don't work, then the neural pathways in people's brains don't tend to engage with the message that you're telling them and it just kind of floats right over their head. But you need someone who can powerfully frame a message like Gil Eagles framed that message and convinced us and said, the more fun you think you're having at that frame, we really believe that we were having fun. Now, in a way, he was duping us and he was hypnotizing us and things like that, and Jesus didn't get into that, but what Jesus did was he was very powerful at the way he framed these conversations because the Pharisees he was talking to had a certain frame, and their frame was one of legalism and one of rules, and they were trying to boil down everything he said into these rules, and he would change these frames, and instead he would tell them these stories that were really powerful, and he would engage them in these stories. And so what I want to say today is that we have to change the metaphors that we use if we want to engage a millennial world or in the current world that we face with the gospel. We don't need to change the gospel, but we have to change our metaphors. And here is the metaphor I want to suggest that we should move towards. My wife, the other day, was uh, out driving around, and she had her iPhone, and, and, and she actually follows the rules of not texting while driving and things like that. She's very conscientious. But at one point, she was getting lost, and her Google Maps wasn't working. And so she called me, and she told me I'm lost. And so I said, well, where are you? which is not something you should say to someone who's lost, right? If you're lost, you're lost, right? And, but my thought was, well, maybe, why, why would she even say this? How can you be lost? She can't be lost these days. She has a phone. She has a phone and several map apps. She should be able to figure out where she is immediately and just follow whatever this tells her. In the old days when you got lost, it meant you were going to get eaten by a bear, right? <laughs> You were going to die. You were going to freeze in the elements. This was serious business. So being lost in the old days was serious. Today, it's nothing. It's a metaphor that when we tell someone they're lost, then, then it's not nearly as powerful as it used to be. And I would suggest that there are other metaphors that we've latched onto, and we begin to view these, and what Lakoff would say is that they become the primary way through which you see the world, and you start to make them at the actual message when they're not the message. They're not the message. They're the way they're framed. Jesus had another very powerful metaphor, and he talked about people being hungry. In fact, he didn't invent this metaphor. Jesus was a fantastic storyteller, but if you look back at the Old Testament, there's fantastic stories that kind of flow through. We started in a garden. Why did we start in a garden? Because God had a plan to nourish us. It wasn't for sentimental reasons or because it makes for good stories, but because God created you, and he wanted to nourish you. He wanted you to grow. And we chose malnutrition over nutrition. And so we have these old stories. It was the story of Eve and the apple, right? Uh, Ruby Payne wrote a book called Bridges to Poverty. And in it, she talks about three ways that you can see food. The poor see food, and they ask this question, is there enough? The middle class see food, and they ask this question, does it taste good? The rich people see food, and they ask this question, is it pretty? 
supply and flavor and presentation. And Eve was very rich, and so she had this pretty question because she had everything that she needed, and so she saw it and she grabbed it and she's out of the garden, and pretty soon her sons are fighting over food and God issues, and one is killing the other. And pretty soon after that, you see these two boys fighting over a bowl of soup. And you go forward and you see a guy named Joseph, and Joseph is thrown in a pit because his brothers are jerks, but also because God has a plan to save the whole world from famine. And so he puts him in with this guy named Pharaoh, who is this monopolizer and who's trying to control the world and all the world's food supply. And God says these group of, of desert nomads will never grow enough food to save the world. The land between the rivers, people, they can do it. They've, they've mastered the Nile. And so God brilliantly puts Joseph in charge of the world's food supply to save the world from famine because God wants to feed his people. And before long, what happens to those people? They trade their means of production. They trade everything. They go back to Joseph. And after swapping off all of these deals, they lose their land. They lose their cows. They lose everything. And then they're there. And Joseph is in charge for a while. But then there's a point in scripture. In fact, as you move into Exodus, the new part of the, the new story, Exodus, which means this journey, right, to come out of the beginning of Exodus, it says this very powerful word in scripture. It says, there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, which means the people were on the outs. And pretty soon they're slaves and they want out and God pulls them out. And when he pulls them out, he takes them out into the desert. And pretty soon they're complaining about what? The food. The food is terrible. We, I wish we were back in Egypt where we had food. And then God does what? He rains down manna on their heads and he feeds them. And they're on their way to a land flowing with milk and honey. And God is going to feed them because they serve a God who wants to feed them. And that story goes forward and it sweeps, and I don't have time to tell it all, but you know many of these stories. You know the story of Elisha. Elisha is fed by ravens. But before that, he's in this super God-feeding deal where they're putting these, these things on the altars, and then this God comes down and cooks the food, and he burns up the whole altar and everything else. And Elisha has these ravens that feed him. And then beyond that, he's running around. He finally lays down and says, I'm just going to die. I'm just going to die here. And all of a sudden, this bread appears to him. And Ruth is gleaning, and David's men are eating food that were meant for the temple. And all through the Old Testament, this God is determined to feed them. The feast of the tabernacle, all of the good things that God is trying to, to feed his people. But they refuse, and they just choose to be malnourished. Until there comes this time in this intertestamental period, and if you look at this hole that's between the end of the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's this gap, and it's several hundred years. And if you were a Jew at that time, things are going from bad to worse. Alexander the Great shows up during that time, and the Greeks take over, and there's this thing called the abomination that led to desecration, where they go in and they sacrifice a pig on the altar, and they take all of the blood and spread it around, and these Jewish women are murdered, and old men are murdered, and it's a terrible time, and thousands and thousands of Jews die. And then, if you think it's bad enough there, it gets worse when the Romans come in, and the Romans take over, and thousands are crucified, as, as N.T. Wright mentioned today. And there's this dark period where, if it's ever doubtful that God really loves to feed people, the Jews are just desperate, and things are terrible. And then, born in a manger, which is a feeding trough, in Bethlehem, which is the house of bread, is a baby. And this baby says, I am the bread of the world. And he shows up. And so God says, I am going to feed you. I'm going to become bread. You haven't gotten the picture yet. In fact, you Jews are so obsessed with what you eat and all these crazy things that these people get so obsessed with missing the point with who Jesus is that basically they kill him because of who he ate with. And if you read the book of Luke, from one story to the next, he's moving and he's eating and he's moving and he's eating. Try to find a chapter in the book of Luke when you don't find Jesus, when he's sitting down at a meal and he's moving on to eat with someone else. And his disciples are saying, there's a lot of people here. We should send them away, Lord. Send them away so that they might buy for themselves something to eat in the nearby villages. And Jesus says, you should feed them. You should feed these people. And there's a story of Zacchaeus, and he says, I'm coming to your house today to eat. And there's story after story. Read Luke 10 through Luke 15, and in every chapter, there's a story about a meal. And he tells these stories about them having a banquet and inviting the wrong people. And it keeps sweeping through until the very end when Jesus goes and he eats that last meal with them. And he says, this is the last time I'll eat with you. And the next day, he dies. He repurposes this great Passover meal that's from the old God who loves to feed them, but they don't get it. And then Jesus is gone. And so what do they do? 
They're walking down the road, as we know in the stories, and it says their eyes are downcast, and they're so sad, and this guy walks up behind him, and he says, what's going on? And they say, are you the only one who hasn't heard what's happened to us? We had all these hopes in Jesus, but now he's gone. It turned, we had hoped that he was the one, and it didn't turn out like we thought. And so then he begins to explain to them everything that had happened, and as they go along, they come, and he says, I have to go on. And they said, no, you should eat with us. And when he goes in to eat with them, what happens when he breaks the bread? They realize who he is, and they had been running away with their eyes downcast and sad because they'd given up and squandered several years of their life, and now Jesus, because of meeting up with Jesus, they run back to Jerusalem, and they meet up with their friends, and they say, you're never going to believe what happened, and they start to tell them the story, and who appears? But Jesus, and he says, do you guys have any food? <laughs> and they give him some food. And Thomas said, I'll never believe this stuff until I see it. And he actually eats some food in front of him. And then Jesus goes again. And then he appears to them the third time. And once again, that's time they're out fishing and they're out trying to get some food. And he says, you should try to throw the nets over there. You'd catch more fish. And they do it. And then Peter looks up and realizes who he is. And he jumps in. And this end of the story, this great climax of an amazing story, the most powerful story ever told, here's how it ends. Jesus cooked some fish and had some bread. The end. And he looked at Peter and he said, what? You should feed my sheep, Peter. Three times he tells him, you should feed my sheep. And Peter said, wait a minute, I don't get this. What do you, do you mean, like literally feed your sheep or, or spiritually? What are you talking about? And Peter doesn't ask any of that because Peter starts to understand. In fact, this church that is built on the rock, that is Peter, transforms the world and changes the world. And it goes out and starts to feed people because God loves to feed people. And we live in a culture today that is a foodie culture. They don't want to hear that you tell them that they're lost because they don't understand what that means. But if you ask them, are you hungry? Are you hungry? I think people will say, yeah. How's your marriage? How are your kids? Do you have time for lunch? I know we do three times a day. We're going to eat. We can sit down with people and we can say, I've got a story about a God who loves to feed us. The Son of Man came, it says in Scripture, three different times. One is to seek and to save the lost. That's the gospel, right? That's what we're to go. When we go out of here, we need to go seek and save the lost. The other is the attitude with which we go. It says, he came not to be served, but to, but to serve. So that's kind of the ethos with which we go out. But do you know what his tactic was? It says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you called him a drunk and a glutton. That was his tactic. And when he sent his disciples out, he said, every time you go to a house, sit down with them and eat with them. That was his whole, when he sent out the 72, that's, that's what he told them to do. In fact, scripture begins with a feast in the garden, and it ends, what? With a feast in Revelation. And all in between, we have these narratives of a God who loves to feed us. And so, here's what I think. Was we go out of this place and we say, man, the Pepperdine lectures were so inspiring. I, I, I want to go out and I want to serve the world. Then go and do what Coleman and his friends are doing. What did, she, what did she say? What? You can get food here? For us to go out and to say, hey, guess what? We're not going to stop there. We're going to talk about important things. We're going to talk about your life. We're going to talk about your marriage. We're going to talk about how God wants to feed you. At the end of the Cold War, uh, in the middle of the Cold War, there was this exchange between the Russians and the Americans. And the Russians sent to New York about 1960 uh, an atomic icebreaker and a bunch of other cool things that they had made to kind of show off to the American people. And they were exhibited at the, at the World's Fair in New York. And so Americans got to go through and think, wow, the Russians really have it together. And then they were trying to impress us. And so we did the same. We sent a, a model home is what we decided to do. And so at ours, we showed off jazz. We sent high-heeled shoes. And we sent basketball. Pretty cool, I think. I'm glad we did that. But we also sent a Betty Crocker model kitchen. And this is a famous story because Nixon went over to open up the model home, and it became known as the kitchen debate. This happened many years ago. But when Nixon goes in, he's the, he's the vice president at the time. Nixon goes in in the kitchen debate, and it just so happens, it wasn't planned, but he ran into Khrushchev at this thing, who was the Soviet premier at the time. And they get into this debate, this back and forth in the middle of this Soviet uh, you know, fair that was kind of awkward and it wasn't planned and the media was there. And so Nixon is there showing off saying, this is what our kitchens look like. And Khrushchev said something very funny. He said, wow, it seems like you have a gadget for everything. 
Do you have one that jams it in your mouth and pushes it down your throat? He asked him. Which is funny because it's not too far from true of all the gadgets we had. But in the midst of that Cold War setting, when we were worried about whether one would blow up the other, here were these two people talking about food and gathered around a kitchen. And there was this connecting point. But what was sad that was going on in both of those cultures is that back in the United States, we had, because of all our gadgetry, started to leave the family meal, started to move to drive throughs and fast food and TV dinners, to the point to where today there's a guy in LA named Ron Finley, who is a guerrilla gardener. And what he says is, I live in East LA, home of the drive-by and the drive through And the funny thing is, these days, the drive throughs are killing more people than the drive-bys because we have this dysfunctional relationship with food. And it wasn't any better over there in the Soviet Union where people in these lonely places didn't trust one another. The KGB would bug the kitchens and so people didn't eat together in kitchens and they just would go to these lonely places in the hallways and they would eat and actually put locks on their pots because they wouldn't share. And these two countries that were so afraid of all of their technology and so worried about one shooting a missile at the other had both spiraled into this dysfunction and they were both so hungry. Both so hungry. And I think it's still going today with a new group of people who say, how many of your friends say, I'm a foodie? I just, I love that. What an opportunity for our churches to sit down with people and to tell them about a God who loves to feed them. It's a transformative opportunity for us to say, here's a new way to frame the gospel. Here's a new narrative. Here's a new metaphor that we can talk about as opposed to the old metaphors, which I don't believe resonate with people who are hungry. Thank you.